and the green button is for you to start. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, before I start, we're all experts here. Are you all tired? <laughs> so what's the action that you have been doing? How to label this video? Okay, um, so my talk is about where is the action? And it's about action recognition. And what I did is I followed the data. So I'll show you some overviews. I'll give you 10 recent data sets, some statistics, and some conclusions about that. Okay, um, so in the beginning, the usefulness of action recognition itself was questioned by uh, Rahul. Um, so why do this? Why study action recognition? And this, this verb here that you see, open, so Ivan, he used the same verb. And that verb to me is a very interesting verb because you, if you want to understand what open means, you really have to go beyond mere appearance, mere correlations or, or motion patterns. To give some examples, so I can open the door of a closet, for example. Okay. I can also open my mouth, which is very different, very different appearance, very different motion. I could even try to open your mouth. <laughs> which will be a very different uh, appearance of motion. Um, I can open the present. If I'm a doctor, I can open up my patient. I can open my laptop. Or actually, I can also use a screwdriver to open my laptop. Okay. These are very different motions in very different settings. And this is very challenging. You have to do some true understanding, whatever that may mean. Um, this is why this is interesting for me. But then, of course, um, there is some real world. So there's other people um, who are also somewhat interested in action recognition. Surveillance, for example. Um, uh, are what things are happening, are suspicious things happening in video. Sports, you want to do analysis of uh, professional games or amateur games. There are stories that you want to find back. So I don't know about you, but I, I have my own NAS. So I have a kid, I have many videos of the kid doing many stupid things. And maybe I want to find them back later. So these are completely unscripted, completely well, they are clipped, so typically I edit that video I, I very mildly at the beginning and at the end. That's it, that's all I do. And they have one thing going on. Um, so these are stories that I want to find back, I want to recognize. And there's also professionals. So if you go to the movies, there's whole stories to be told. But these are different settings for professionals. And there are indeed, as mentioned, robotics or as autonomous agents if you want to interact with a robot, or if you want to have go towards the self-driving car uh, promise. Okay, so these are the 10 data sets I looked at. And these are typically, these are only action data sets. So there's also other data sets. So Ivan talked about the how-to data set. There's also hands data set. There's captioning data sets. There's many other uh, data sets, but I only looked at the action data sets. And I'll give you a quick and how uh, a quick overview of what they are and how to best do that is just to visit the website. So this is ActivityNet. ActivityNet has 200 classes, there's 100 videos, untrimmed videos per class, 1.5 instance per video. You can then go, you can explore this data set a bit. So these websites have become much nicer recently. <laughs> that's Ava, it was mentioned already. So this is 80 atomic visual actions. These are 15 minute movie clips. It's very long, very difficult, and you have to localize actions here. And if you, if I explore this, then I think I get some examples. Well, some examples of the data set has been uh, shown before. And on this day, there are charades. 
So charades is completely unscripted and they ask actually Mechanical Turk people, so Ivan is in the, in the room, to, to record, for, well first to give a script and then to record the script themselves. So this is, this is more in the, in the story setting of, of amateurs. There's a charades ego version, so that has not just uh, someone performing an action from the third person point of view, but they have a, a um, similarly, they also have the same action, well, not exactly aligned, so it's, it's the same action done again, from an egocentric point of view, and you can learn embeddings between that. There's Epic Kitchens, let's advertise it again. Why not? I think it needed it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a very nice, very recent uh, egocentric data set. There's something called Hacks. Clips and Hux segments. So these are, well, the, the Hux clips are two second clips. And there's 1.5 million of them. Um, and there's also segments that have a complete beginning and an end. They also have, I think, 30,000 of them. Here are some examples of that. There is kinetics, was, um, well, already mentioned a lot. I don't think I have actually a working link for this, but uh, there's, a, there's a slide some here from uh, the, the 700 classes. There's the moments in time data set. So this is understanding actions. This is three second videos of also that goes beyond humans. It also goes to animals and objects and other, um, other types of actions. There's the something something data set that was mentioned before, and that's that's a data set when you have to do something with something. And it doesn't really matter what you do, but well, there are certain examples. So here are some some example clips. And if you go, I scroll down a bit, and you see some more statistics. So putting something on the surface, moving something up, covering something with something. They even have very difficult. As you see here, very difficult examples of trying to pour water into a glass but missing it. <laughs> you really have to understand your action to do well. And there is a multi-label version of Tumos. So Tumos itself I didn't mention, but there is a very, there's a, someone did, well these people they did uh, a very dense annotations of the two most video uh, videos themselves. So I didn't give any of my own recent work, but I just analyzed some statistics of these data sets. So one thing to look at is the task. So is it classification? Let's see. Is it temporal localization? That's just well, that, that's finding in a video when does an action start, when does an action end, in a long, untrimmed video. There's STL spatial temporal local, localization, that's also when you find the tube. So then, in addition to finding the beginning and the end of the frame, you also have to find the bounding box, where the action is occurring. And ML is when, when something is multi-labeled. So sometimes you can have multiple actions going on at the same time in real-world settings. And then the statistics that I looked at is then how many labels are there, how many hours of video, how many are videos themselves, how many segments and how many actions do you have in such a video. And then if you go through the motions then you get this. <laughs> okay. Talk over. Um, okay, if you look at these statistics and well, maybe you see other things than I see. Um, so one of the things that I see here in red is the number of hours. So these are 10 recent data sets and we really are increasing the size of these data sets. Another thing is labels. So Earlier, the goal was to arrive at a thousand. So the Kinetic 700 already has 700 of them. 
But if you look at the other data sets, it seems a bit difficult to scale. So for ImageNet, well, we have a thousand, but there was a subset of the, I don't know how many there are in total of the ImageNet. <coughs> but for our actions, in a way, it, it's strange that it's so difficult to get to, get to more labels. And here is this multi-label setting. So Ava has spatial temporal localization and you have multiple labels at the same time. So you can have someone talking and listening at the same time, uh, at different locations. And this multi tumos also has multiple labels. So actually there's not so much, it's not so many data sets that have this. So this fine-grained labeling is present, but not yet so common. So maybe there's a future uh, there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you released them already. Ah, okay, I'll adapt the slides. <laughs> okay, so where is the action? Um, so what I think we should do is we should reduce this annotation effort. So it has been mentioned before, but what I think we should do specifically, um, we should investigate visual inductive priors. And what do I mean by that? It's what the convolution is to, deep, to, to image recognition and deep learning. So if you do deep networks and you add the convolution operator, you get a convolutional neural network. And that means that if I want to recognize a certain object, that I don't have to give examples of this object at every location in the image. Because my convolution, I slide it over the whole image, is equivariant. So this is a Great example, and that means that I have to give orders of magnitude less training data. And I think the way forward is to find these visual inductive priors for video. Maybe the slow fast network is maybe one example of, of, of how to do that. And uh, maybe it's good to stress that I see this as, as being orthogonal to improvements on deep learning architectures. So things like batch norm are wonderful, but okay, they work everywhere. So what do we as a community, what works now for video? Yeah, so the data sets are huge. Um, so I'm from a poor university. <laughs> <laughs> so at CVPR I was at a very nice uh, workshop and I asked them, oh, very nice, uh, how many GPUs did you use? Ah, 128 for a week. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we have 60. Uh, not, for our, not for my group, but for the whole department. <laughs> so it's all the master students, all the PhD students. So how to do that? So how to reduce the memory and the computational demands of video? Both for training and for testing. So test was, uh, has been mentioned before, but also for training especially, it's difficult for us. Uh, related to this, if you train from scratch on small data sets, you don't do so well. And by small data sets, um, so the UCF 101, yeah, in some sense, is not even that small. But we, we've seen some numbers earlier. Um, if you just do a dense trajectories with the, with the Fisher vector, you do much better than the trained CNN if you train it from scratch. Okay, if you pre-train on kinetics, it's wonderful. But how can you actually how can you train from scratch, from, from smaller data sets? Okay, this has mentioned, mentioned before, so there's maybe some dependency between earlier talks and this, but yeah, there is a long-term uh, dependency. So how can you do classification based on something that happened a long time ago? And the example that I always give is, if I'm in the store and I take something, I put it back later, I walk out the store, no problem. If I take something, walk around a bit, don't put it back, I walk out the store, oh, there's a problem. You cannot classify that just by looking at me walking out the store. You have to do some reasoning. So it depends on what happened some time ago. And what I've also been thinking about and also asking people is why do we treat time differently than space? Okay, there's sampling issues, of course. Space is pixels, time is in uh, milliseconds. Um, there's causality, but actually open and close seem 
as, as presented earlier, seem you can swap them around, so causality doesn't always hold. So there's, there's optical flow, um, there is 2D plus 1, so you decompose time and space differently, but why is time always treated differently? And that, that would be interesting. Yeah, to me, um, so I think one of the problems, if you, if you want to learn a motion, if you want to learn a motion from my hand, now you want to learn a motion from this thing, yeah, it, it, it explodes. You have to learn all motions again for every different appearance. I think that's what, 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 op, what makes optical flow so important. Because optical flow is, it doesn't look at the appearance. It's just the motion as is. That I think is, some, some understanding there is, uh, is interesting. Let me end here, if you have any questions. <laughs>